In the closing of Abraham Lincoln's first inaugural address, he uh, says to the Union, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies, though passions may have strained us. It must not break our bonds of affection. This lecture will cover the outbreak of war between the North and the South at the Battle of Fort Sumter, the Lincoln administration's emphasis on the war being for the preservation of union and not slavery, uh, the end of slavery, and also the significance and the of the border regions, the states between the North and the South, pro-union slavery states like Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, and Delaware. Um, Lincoln, as an attorney, will be insistent that constitutionally there is no way for the South to break away from the North, that the Constitution allows for, for territory to come in, but there are no provisions for it to leave, uh, and thus the South cannot be uh, considered an independent country or countries. Um, this is obviously in juxtaposition with what we've read from John C. Calhoun, who argues the the using the compact theory that because states can come in voluntarily, they can leave voluntarily. Um, Lincoln, throughout the course of the war, will refuse to acknowledge that the South is an independent entity, and he encourages them to uh, end the rebellion and to resume their rightful and equal place amongst the states as part of the Union. Um, in other words, that like conjoined twins that share vital organs, they cannot be divided without the collapse of both. Perhaps most people are familiar with the Lincoln line that a house against its, uh, a house divided against itself cannot stand. All of this imagery points to the number one most important um, initiative of the Lincoln presidency, which is to maintain union. Uh, the opening of the Civil War, uh, if you do not count the clashes between militias in, in Kansas, comes with the um, outbreak of, of uh, warfare in the harbor of Charleston, South Carolina, commonly referred to as the Battle of Fort Sumter. Um, as we discussed in the previous lesson, the election of Abraham Lincoln led to the secession of South Carolina. When Lincoln indicates that he would not support the Crittenden Compromise, four other, uh, excuse me, uh, six other states leave as well. Um, this means that uh, there, there's a whole region of border states that are in the balance, in flux, and by the end of the Battle of Fort Sumter, we will see four other states making a total of 11 Confederate states um, intent on seceding. Um, the Battle of Fort Sumter takes place as one of the consequences of the action states took when they left the Union. Many of them tried to seize federal property or federal uh, forts and military installations specifically. Uh, this is a good example. Um, in, in the harbor of Charleston, an enormous new top of the line uh, fort had been constructed. Charleston at the time was the most important uh, seaport in the South and this particular fortification um, was instrumental to its commerce and its defense. Uh, Lincoln ordered commanding officers of these, place, uh, of these places to maintain their presence and uh, to not surrender to any pressure to remove them. Now, Fort Sumter is special because it's basically an island. And so the South Carolina militia was uh, not able to Im immediately take control of Fort Sumter. And so a standoff uh, occurs. Um, the... South Carolina, Carolinian government indicates to President Lincoln that any attempt to reinforce the fort will be considered an act of war. And 
Um, so this standoff takes place from the time Lincoln is inaugurated until uh, mid-April of 1861. As provisions started to run low in the fort, uh, you know, and, and food and supplies became scarce, Lincoln is put in the position of whether he's going to escalate the conflict by resupplying the fort or uh, bow to pressure from South Carolina to, um, to surrender it. Trying to seek the middle ground, trying to seek an approach that would not escalate tension and look as though the North were initiating the first combat or conflict and yet not surrendering uh, was a delicate balance for Lincoln. Uh, what he ended up doing is notifying the South Carolina government that he intended to provision the fort, meaning send food and necessary supplies, but no additional men to the fort, and so that it was should not be considered an act of reinforcement. Well, these finer details were lost on the Carolinians, and uh, in an attempt to provision the fort in the dead of night, uh, this move sparked the initial outbreak of uh, fire between Union and Confederate forces. Basically what takes place is uh, a skirmish, 30, a day and a half, 34 hour bombardment of the militia forces on the shore and the Union forces within Fort Sumter. Uh, miraculously, no lives are lost, but the consequence of this conflict, not only being the first initial official battle between the two sides, but the fact that um, it has social ramifications is what's most important to remember about Fort Sumter. So Southern states are going to view this as an act of aggression on the behalf of the Union. And Northerners are going to look at it as a official act of rebellion uh, by the South. So uh, the northern, the people of the North are electrified and provoked to fight. Um, one of Lincoln's first actions following Fort Sumter is to issue a call to arms in which 75,000 volunteers report for duty. He also initiates a blockade of all southern seaports. Um, Union will, from the very beginning, have uh, the... the uh, predominant strength on the ocean. And Lincoln wants to keep it that way. The big concern is that foreign intervention might take place, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. On the Confederate side, the outbreak of war at Fort Sumter leads four more states to declare uh, secession. Another thing that takes place is the capital moves from uh, Montgomery, Alabama, its initial seat to Washington, D.C. Oh, correction. Another thing that takes place is the capital uh, of the Confederacy moves from Montgomery, Alabama to Richmond, Virginia. Uh, this is as a response to the need for a stronger, more centralized government for the Confederacy that is closer to the population center, closer to the conflict zone. And so even though Montgomery was, is, was relatively more secure, um, now we have the two competing capitals, Washington, D.C. and Richmond, Virginia, within 40 miles of each other. But it's, an, it's a necessity based on the transportation and communication systems of the 19th century. This map demonstrates the final division of the nation. Uh, you can see in blue, we have the Union states from the outset. Uh, in yellow, we have the initial um, seven states that break away following the election of Lincoln and the failure of the Crittenden Compromise. In orange, we have the remaining four states that uh, secede following Fort Sumter, and in green, are those important uh, border states that remain with the Union. Now we're gonna talk a lot about the border states, uh, Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, 
these uh, slave states that remain with the Union. When you're in elementary school, a lot of times the Civil War is painted in so simple terms, free versus slave states. Um, this is historically incorrect. Uh, the Union did maintain slavery where it already existed in the, these border states. And Lincoln walks a delicate uh, tightrope in order to keep them. Uh, of course, he's on the record as being a free soiler, but any effort to emancipate might lead to the, these states to join the secession movement. And so we have to consider why were these states so important to keep, you know, keep happy and to maintain within the union outside of the fact that Lincoln's primary objective is to maintain union. Well, they're significant in a military capacity for the following reasons. First of all, um, these particular border states contain basically half of the entire white population of the Confederacy. So in essence, if they go to the Confederate side, the Confederacy is going to more double its white population, double its capacity to en engage in a war. Uh, furthermore, these states have uh, manufacturing centers that would uh, certainly increase the power of the Confederacy's ability to sustain military conflict. Third reason why the border states are important is their access to important waterways. The Ohio River runs right along the border of Kentucky down to Missouri, St. Louis. The Ohio River connecting with the Mississippi uh, is a superhighway of the time. It, it basically drives a, a wedge between the North and the South, but then uh, to be able to control the Ohio and the Mississippi joined with the blockade of Southern seaports would effectively encircle the South um, and cut off their ability to communicate and trade with anybody outside of the United States. Um, now, Lincoln is walking a tight rope. He's not especially popular in the border states, uh, as we saw with the elections. There are a lot of people in this region that vote for John Bell, uh, Fred, uh, excuse me, Stephen Douglas, and John Breckinridge. Uh, it's not as though these people buy into the Republican platform, but they have an investment in union, but that can be easily uh, lost as far as the uh, Lincoln's power is concerned if he doesn't make the right moves. So in order to maintain the border states, Lincoln has to avoid the slavery question, and he also is going to use force that we wouldn't typically associate with uh, American democracy. For example, he initiates martial law, which is uh, the control of local law enforcement and governance under military law. He deploys a massive number of those 75,000 troops west to Missouri and also in the western parts of Virginia, the parts that will eventually break away and form West Virginia. Um, and so at the, basically the force of a bayonet, Lincoln maintains order and maintains loyalty within these borderline states. Over and over and over again, Lincoln is required to declare, defend, re remind people that this is a war, not about slavery, but about union. Uh, as I had said, the border regions and western parts of the United States were filled with um, Democrats that had been supportive of some other candidate. Many of these Democrats in northern territories had migrated from the south and had southern leaning sympathies. Uh, as we talked about in a previous lecture, it seems that President Buchanan had sort of uh, suggested that the south, while it was wrong, could leave and not be stopped and that, that secession could take place peacefully. And so there's a large body of the American population that believe that the South and the North have become too different and they're sympathetic to the notion that the South should, could 
be allowed to leave um, without any kind of violence. A uh, nickname for these Southern sympathizers, uh, especially in the West, are the butternuts. Butternut is a nickname for a pecan. Um, pecans come are grown in the South, uh, but they're enjoyed everywhere. But they're a soft and sort of a sweet nut. And so the notion that there are these people that are soft and sweet on the Southern cause in the North uh, is, is used as a nickname to describe this, to describe them. Um, war did not begin between slave and free soil, but began as a war for union. The matter of slavery will be decided when it's a, a practical matter for the success of the union's cause. Uh, Native American groups as well were divided by the Civil War. Um, the Cherokee Nation, the Creeks, the Choctaws, and the Chicksaws, Seminoles, these uh, quote-unquote civilized tribes um, that had been transplanted from the South, actually engaged in slavery while in Indian Territory, present-day Oklahoma, and uh, had an ingrained distrust of the American government and came to believe that perhaps the Confederate government would be more sympathetic and supportive of their rights and claims to territory, so sided with the Confederacy. On the other end, uh, most Plains Indians sided with the Union. This war literally divided families, with some um, members of a family going, to fight off, go on, going off to fight for the Union, and others going southward to fight for the Confederacy. There were Southerners that volunteered for the North and Northerners that volunteered for the South. Um, the only difference in many cases between one side or the other was the color of their uniform. This is an image of a famous American general by the name of George Armstrong Custer, probably more familiar to you when we're talking about um, the Indian Wars later in the 19th century. Uh, Custer is seated, seated here with James B. Washington. Um, both graduated in the same class from West Point Military Academy, and uh, Washington was a prisoner of war at the time this photo was taken. But the two men, both commanding officers for opposite sides of the, of the uh, battlefield, considered one another friends. And so uh, this image was, was taken, and it really demonstrates just how um, similar and yet divided the two regions of the country were. <laughs> 